Happy Thanksgiving late, but better late than never. Hey, a couple things that I want to address before I officially jump into the sermon. Number one, uh, sort of the heart and the prayer that I have for you in this season uh, would be that this would be a season filled with worship and a season filled with generosity. Um, we're kicking off this season, um, really Wednesday night with a night of worship. That is a time of just sort of focusing our hearts, uh, remembering what the season is all about. Um, we're going to be singing. We're going to be praying. We're going to just be asking God. Like we don't want to just go through a Christmas season through the motions. We want to encounter him. Amen. Uh, also, on top of that, it's a season of generosity. And so um, out in the lobby, there are trees with these little tags. And I want to encourage you to get one of those. So you see the night of worship. Uh, there's two gatherings. Uh, be early for those. Uh, it'll be a little crowded. But also, there are trees out in the lobby. And I would encourage you to grab one of these tags for gifts. And you can bring them on the night of worship or you can bring them next Sunday. We're going to be collecting gifts for one of our local uh, organizations we partner with called Warrior for Children, who they serve children and families who have been living through trauma. And in a season like this, we want to come alongside and provide encouragement. So the trees are filled with these tags, grab a tag, bring the gifts back so a kid can enjoy. But it's a season of generosity. And this is one way to help uh, participate in that, making a difference in others. And so generosity isn't just about our wish lists, like nothing wrong with the wish list. It's also about uh, not just being uh, consumed by materialism and greed. Sorry, that's me. I'm trying to adjust this. It, it's also about saying, Lord, how can I help others? I woke up this morning, did this prayer journey through Lectio 365, and, and this is a, a statement, a question that they asked us to do. It said, take a moment and name a member of your own church or a friend who are finding life particularly tough in this season. And so I begin to name some of you. And I begin to think about some of you, a diagnosis has just rocked your home, your life in this season. The loss of a loved one has marked the rest of your life. There's an addiction. And whether you're not in our Celebrate Recovery program on a, on a Tuesday night, maybe you're not. Maybe you're struggling all alone. Uh, there's the loss of, of a loved one. And whether you're in our grief share, ministering to, to others who are in a similar journey on a Monday night or not, maybe you're all alone. There's financial worries and stress in a season like this. And I just begin to pray for some of you. Our, our widows, they were here at the nine o'clock, a, a big group who just are journeying together in this season. And, and as I was praying name by name by name, this is sort of what God was reminding me of. You're a church. And a church is supposed to be a place for hurting people. It's supposed to be a light in a dark world. And when financial uh, catastrophe comes, when the loss of a loved one uh, devastates a home in the middle of uh, struggling with deep addiction, all of these kinds of things, I just started praying for some of you this morning. Very often, you may not know this, very often when people are looking for help, guess where they turn? Their church. This is a unique season when it comes to financial needs in our economy. So we have what's called a benevolence fund where we're able to help occasionally people who come and we have an application, an interview, because we're, we're doing due diligence. Uh, this year, the, the budget for our benevolence fund was $13,000. By the end of September, we had already given away over $25,000. Not because we're bad with math, but because we're like, God is uniquely working and people are, their hearts are, are being stirred to come like hillsiders. And so you may not know this, but when you're generous to the church, one of the ways we get to help in addition to all these other ways is we're able to provide for those who are in deep financial need in seasons like this. So I was just thinking this morning, thank you for your generosity. It matters. It matters. Tuesday's Giving Tuesday. And I just want to remind you that we do everything in our power to be good stewards of the money that you entrust to us. And so in Giving Tuesday, and as we end this year, my prayers, we financially would be able to just end this year so amazingly well that we are launching into 2024 with all the vision and the hopes and the dreams God has planted in our hearts. And it's going to take all of us to be in that. Amen? Okay, so that's, that's, that's that part. This week, I was preparing this series in Philippians. So you can open up your Bible to Philippians chapter three. 
And I was just reminded, there's so many famous verses in Philippians. Like if you've been around the church, you've, you've heard some of these verses. Maybe even if you haven't been around the church, you've heard or seen some of these verses. I was thinking through a list of like, what are the most popular verses in Philippians? And so I started, I, I found a website that ranked the most popular verses in all of the, I didn't even know that that existed, but I found it. So look at this slide. Most popular verses in Philippians, uh, chapter one, verse 21, to live is Christ, to die is gain. That, according to this website, is the 594th most popular verse in all of the Bible. I was like, oh, I thought it would be in the 400s at least. Um, Chapter 3, verse 14, we'll deal with this one today. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ. That's the 1,644 most popular verse in the Bible. Uh, four, six, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Have you ever heard that verse? Just raise your hand up. Do you, have you heard that? Uh, maybe it's on a, a, a plaque on your wall. Um, it's the 66th most popular verse in the Bible. And by the way, this, that's where we will be next week. That in this next verse four, seven and the peace of God. So Uh, If you are dealing with anxiety and you need peace, you want to be here next week to find out what Paul has to say about that. 4-7, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The 1,331st most popular verse in all of the Bible. And then lastly, uh, Philippians 4-13, I can do all of this through him who gives me strength. The 54th most popular verse in all of the Bible. But these aren't verses like slogans or Christian cliches. These aren't just the kind of thing that you're like, you know what? I want this piece of art on my wall and put this verse up there that just says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. It's not the, it's not the coffee mug slogan like, let's go. Like I, I want to make up my own. Let us go. Let's go. It's not, it's not that. It's not this, hey, I want to help you feel a little bit better about yourself. Whoa, that just got really messy really fast. It's not one of those like pick-me-ups. This is the word of God, and these are verses to give us a deep-rooted anchor kind of hope for the soul. It's not just a trite phrase that we throw on a bad day or a tough season in life. These Truths are filled with invitations to inspire, encourage us, to to shape our minds, and also to bring direction, redirection, even conviction when necessary. When, When we begin to read these words, not just with our minds, but with our whole heart and our soul, we begin to see these words are life. These words are directing us and guiding us to how do we truly experience purpose and peace and and joy. And hope that's not dependent upon our circumstances. It's more than that. It's not just superficial. See, see these verses aren't, aren't pop, pop psychology. It's not just self-help. These, these verses, it's not Paul as your hype man. You can do it. This is not the Apostle Paul saying four st- steps to a happy life. Waterboy fans over there. That you look in the mirror and say to yourself to be a little bit more happy. These are words for life. So chapter 3 verse 12 is where I'll start reading. But you can't really understand chapter 3 verse 12 unless you get a glimpse of what happened before that. And so here's the real synopsis in the verses before that. Paul says, I want to know Christ more than anything. All those old achievements and success don't matter compared to knowing Christ. Knowing Christ is of more surpassing, greater worth than anything. Paul says, that's what I want more than anything. Then he says, in verse, writes in verse 12, not that I have already obtained all of this. He's saying, I'm not perfect. Or have already attained at my goal, arrived at my goal. But I press on. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, remember this is a letter. He's writing to people that he loved dearly. He knows them. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. He's like, I'm still a work in progress. I'm still trying to figure these things out. This is the Apostle Paul writing the Bible 
saying, I'm not perfect. I'm aiming though, I'm pressing on towards Jesus. And, and this one phrase or one idea roots all of this. Paul says, I press on. It's a word of endurance. It comes from the athletic world of the ancient uh, life of, of like running, enduring, persisting, not giving up and, and just staying at it, being resilient in life. Paul says, I press on. I haven't already attained, but I press on. So put this slide up. We want to talk about what it means to press on, what it means to press towards the goal. And we'll define what, what even the goal means. But, but lesson number one, thing number one that Paul says is pressing towards the goal is first about forgetting and focusing. It's first about forgetting and focusing. Look at verse 13. I'll start reading in the middle of that verse. Paul says, but one thing I do. If you're able, would you just do this? Put one finger up, preferably your pointer finger. Um, just raise it up real quick. One thing I do. If you were to just tell me, what's the one thing you do? What would the one thing be? So Paul says, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining towards what is said. Don't you love it when somebody says, the one thing I do, but then they give you two things. <laughs> They're like, the one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is head, I press on. There it is again. I press on. Toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul says, I'm pressing on, and this is what I'm doing. I'm trying to stay focused on the goal. I'm trying to stay on track with my life. I'm trying not to give up. I'm pressing on, and how am I doing that? First and foremost, I'm pressing on by forgetting and by focusing. I'm pressing on by forgetting and focusing. Like I said, this metaphor comes from this ancient world where they had something like the Olympic Games. And I think Paul's probably a fan of sports. And so he uses that metaphor over and over again to describe what it means to spiritually follow Jesus and, and with our whole heart to be devoted. You, you don't look at an Olympic athlete and say, eh, they're sort of committed. They're trying. They're trying track. They're, they're trying for a gold medal. No, they're training for a gold medal, Right? They're training. They, they put their body into, uh, Paul says, submission, subjection. Paul says, I don't fight like a boxer in the air aimlessly. No, 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 I, I, I'm targeting. He says, I don't run like a runner without a purpose. He says, I'm pressing on with purpose. I'm, I'm pressing on forgetting what's behind and focusing to what's ahead. Forgetting what's behind. Read those earlier verses in chapter three. We talked about it last week. Paul says, I'm forgetting all of those things that I used to think defined me. Identity and success and achievements and what I wanted to do. I'm forgetting all of that. I'm losing that, that I can gain Christ. But that's the success. But he's also, I think, saying, I'm also forgetting some of the failures, some of the hurts, some of the pain points in my life. I'm forgetting those. Now, if you have ever had pain points, hurts, uh, have you forgotten it? <laughs> no. So what good would it be right now if I'm like, oh, you've had hard times. Oh, you've had a relationship, broke your heart. Here, I want you to do, forget it. You're like, it doesn't really work like that. And, and Paul says, I'm forgetting what's behind as I strain for what's ahead. I'm forgetting what's behind as I understand God is still a God of grace in forgiveness, in compassion. Aren't you glad for that? God is a God who still sets us free from oppression. He breaks chains in our lives. He still works in these powerful ways to lead us closer and to empower us by the Holy Spirit so we can follow. He's like, so through God's strength, I'm forgetting what's behind. But I'm also forgetting what's behind because I'm not obsessed by it because I'm straining towards what's ahead. I'm focusing on what's ahead. And there's a renewal of the mind that Paul talks about again and again through scripture. These truths renew our mind. And so he's like, part of the way that I'm forgetting is because I'm focusing on what's ahead of me. I'm straining, literally is the word. And straining in the ancient world, it, this is literally the definition. It means to stretch. Would you just do that with me? Would you just stretch? Like stretch whichever way, don't punch anybody, but you stretch. <clears throat> and this word means you're stretching, like you've stretched enough, but then you stretch, you, you're fully extended. Yeah. 
You, you've given it everything that you can. Now, I saw some of you do this like you're stretching right and left at the same time. I'm like, you can't stretch two ways at the same time, only one for a true stretch. And so what Paul's saying, hey, I'm straining towards the goal. I'm stretching, I'm focusing towards the goal. And I'm convinced that one of the greatest struggles to us, you and I, pressing on with Christ is that we're trying to focus on too many things. We've, we don't have one thing anymore. You're like, listen, Aaron, I'm a, I'm a Christian trying to follow Jesus and I'm focusing on 10 things, my top 10 list. And you're like, the good news is it was 20 last year, but I made a new year's resolution and I'm down to 10. And I'm like, you, you can't do that. It doesn't work that way. There's only one number one thing in our lives. And Paul says, there's one thing that I'm going after. And, and to press on towards the goal, it means I forget what's behind. I strain towards what is hid in order to get the goal. Look, look what he says. Um, where is that at? I've already, I already lost my place. Verse 14, Paul says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. What's your goal? What's your finish line? What, what would be that thing that is like, when I do that, then I'm, I'm successful? So when I was young, it was, here's my goal. I want to finish school. I said that in high school, and then guess what? I went to college. I was like, what's my goal? I want to finish school. And so I finished school, and guess what? Then I went on and got a master's. I want to finish school, and I was done, done, done. So I have not went back. But what's next? Like, what kind of goal is that to arrive at to just say, check, check? Oh, new goal. I need a new goal. I want a good job. I want a career. And so, so some of us are on this path of striving, straining to the goal of a good career. And we get that good career. We get that job. We finally maybe get just a little bit of success. And we're like, is this all there is? What's next? And so we're looking for that next thing. For, for some people, it's, I want to get married. And so we're, we're looking at this getting married. And then like there's an engagement. Then there's a wedding. And we have this big wedding. Then we realize, oh, whoa, I prepared for a wedding. I'm totally unprepared to be married. And uh, being married is a lot harder than a wedding. Can I get an amen, married people? That was a little bit too eager of an amen from some of you. And it's like, well, I got married. Now what? What do I do now? And then some of us are like, the next election, the goal is to get through the next election because that election's finally going to fix everything. Okay, next topic. My goal is to retire. And what I want to do is retire. And when I have retired, I'm there and I'm done. Whew. What if God's not done? And what if his purpose doesn't end at 65 or 70 or 80 or not? His purpose doesn't end till the day you die. And that's the point Paul is talking about. The goal is not here on earth. The goal is nothing temporary. The goal, it's related to eternal things. It's knowing him. The prize is Jesus. The prize is knowing God. And that prize cannot be fully appreciated. It's not completed until after we die, which is not a popular message or an easy thing to think through in a culture like ours where we want to more deny death and its reality rather than embrace it and say, maybe that's exactly what God is up to. It's radical in 2023 in Southern California. I understand that. But the goal isn't winning. The goal isn't getting what I want. The goal is the fulfillment of a lifelong passion, knowing God and being with him. Not distracted by other things. Straining towards the things ahead, towards the ultimate purpose. So it requires forgetting. It requires focusing. There's a reprioritization that has to happen. First, Pressing towards the goal is about forgetting and focusing. Second, it's about setting our minds. Setting our minds. Paul uses this language a number of times in Philippians. It's about a mindset. It's about a way of thinking. It's about, the, another translation could be attitude. 
It's about the attitude we live with, the, the worldview we have. Starting in verse 15, Paul writes this. All of us then who are mature. If you have a King James version, it says perfect. It, it means complete. It means a finished work. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to uh, what we have already attained. So Paul is saying, hey, for those of us who are mature, perfect, it doesn't mean like perfect in what we do. Paul's saying in one sense, in a spiritual realm, because of Jesus, faith in Christ makes us perfect before God, not practically living out being perfect in this world because we're still in this world. And Paul says, I've not already attained. I'm not there yet. But, but here's what Paul is saying. For those of us who are mature, there's a certain mindset. There's a certain view. There's a certain attitude that would mark what maturity looks like in this world. When I was, when I was young growing up in church, I, I would look at people uh, at church uh, I was watching churchy people. Do you know what I mean, watching churchy people? Anybody grow up in church and you watched churchy people? And I tried to figure out, what does it mean to be mature? What do you think it means to be mature? Like, like when I was growing up, I thought, if you're old, then you're mature. And then I got older and I realized there's a lot of immature old people. Age has nothing to do with it necessarily. Growing up in church, I would say, you know who's mature? The people with the biggest Bible. Does anybody here have a Bible bigger than this one? This is an NIV thin line. I would look at some of you and I'm like, you're mature. More highlights. You don't have more highlights in your Bible than I do because I teach out of it. That must be the mature person. You got a big Bible. I thought maybe you're mature just because you show up a lot at church. Like every time the doors open, you show up. You must be mature. Let me help you. Not necessarily. Oh, you're mature. You serve. Every time there's an opportunity to serve, you sign up. You serve. You must be mature. Let me just tell you, there's the kind of serving that's more self-serving than it is mature serving. How do you know that happens? Just mess up some of the details, put a few wrinkles in the plan and see the uh, come out and you realize, oh, that was self-serving, not other serving. Just because you serve a lot. Like, these are good things, but they're not the marks of maturity. I thought, you know what? Here, growing up in church, I thought, people who talk about giving a lot of money, they must be mature. Or talk not a lot about giving a lot of money. Talk a lot about giving money. And the older I've gotten, sometimes I've realized the people who talk about giving money a lot often complain and gripe and actually don't give anything. What's, what does it mean to be mature, have the most verses memorized, know all the songs, the hymns in those days. All of these things are good things, but doing these things without a mind that is set on Christ never leads to maturity. It's not about activity. It's about the heart behind. It's about the whole life. Here's how Paul defines the mindset of the mature. Look at this slide. It's about the mindset. It's about the, the view that we take. And he says, the mature mindset it's about those who are centered on the gospel. Jesus is in the center of your life. It's about those who are seeking unity. They're not divisive. They're seeking unity. That's the mindset of the mature. Look at these verses. Maybe, maybe take a picture of this slide and look it up later. Um, they're humble like Jesus. Chapter 2, verse 5. The mindset of the mature is one of humility, just like Jesus. Here in our passage today, 319, the mindset of the mature is an eternal perspective. You've set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Chapter four, verse 10, Paul writes that um, the mindset of the mature is you're caring for each other. Not what's in this for me. You're, you're caring for each other. With that in mind, the mature person may be a young person who is courageously standing up for Jesus at their school, even though they're all alone, they're saying no to the places everybody else is saying yes to. And they may be 15, but they may be more mature than anybody on your row. Right. The mature person may be that unseen servant who gets little attention or credit, but that's okay. They're mature. They're not serving for the attention or the credit. The mature person may be the single mom who financially is struggling month by month, 
but still seeking to be a generous person, a give first kind of obedience. And month by month, in small ways and sometimes pretty large ways, sees God provide radically. You see, you may not know a lot of the stories of the mature because mature people don't go around talking about how mature they are. They just live it. Paul says, press on that way. Set your mind on those things. Live that way. Live these realities out. So first, pressing towards the goal is about forgetting. It's about focusing. It's about setting our minds. Third, it's about following this example. Following this example. Look at verse, um, my page flipped over. Verse 17, Paul writes, join together in following my example. Literally translated, here's what it means. Imitate me. That's all. It's like a command. Paul says, imitate me. Just like Jesus said to his disciples, follow me. Paul is able to say, follow me. Imitate me. Um, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, then he includes those around him, those at the church in Philippi. Look, focus on us, follow us as an example, as a model. Keep your eyes on those who live as we do. So he's saying, I want you to follow an example that will help you experience everything that God has for you in life. Follow me. It, it's, there's a model that is given. There, there's, there's an example that has been a lived out reality before their eyes and Paul saying, do that. It's, it's for you sports fan who maybe you had a coach at some point and the coach, let's say it was a golf uh, instructor. They're, they're looking at your swing. They're telling you what you did right, how to correct things. There, there's a model that you're trying to follow. Maybe you were like, I want to be the next Tiger Woods. So you got a red shirt and black pants and you're like, I'm following this example. In business, where, where you work, maybe it's somebody that has gone before you and you're like, that's the kind of person I want to be. That's the kind of leader I want to be. And so you, you follow, they were a model, they were a mentor. Maybe it's an author or a podcaster and you're like, I really love how they think about things and I, I want to be shaped by them. It's like this time of year, there, there's these cookie cutters for Christmas cookies. So there's like a Christmas tree, a gingerbread man, and you just, it's a form, it's a mold, it's a model. That's what Paul's talking about, a model. And, and so you're stamped into this model. You become that model you're trying to emulate, that form you're following. And some of us are like, you know what form I want to have? I want the form of fun. <laughs> Somebody who lives and they have fun and pleasure, do whatever they want to do. That's the model. I want to be in the model of fun. Okay. What else? Some of us are like, the model that I'm wanting to follow is successful. I want to be successful like they are. Well, how do you define that? Okay, it means climb the corporate ladder. It means get this kind of paycheck, get this kind of car, get this kind of house. Then I've arrived. That's my model. Okay, what's next? Some of you are like, I just want to survive. Do you know how hard what is going on is? I just want to survive. But in just surviving, if we're not careful, and some of us are in that place, but in just surviving, it can rob you of all joy. You can do it begrudgingly. You can do it full of complaints. What else? And Paul is saying, follow me. Follow us as we follow Christ as we seek to know him more than anything, because then you'll have a model that can endure the ups and the downs of this world. You'll have a strength in the midst of changing seasons of your life. You'll have a hope and a peace and a joy that goes beyond the 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 years you will live on this earth. Follow my example. Paul's saying that about his crew that's around him. Would, would there ever be a day that we as Hillside Community Church could say to the Inland Empire, follow us as we follow Jesus because we believe life is better Jesus' way? Not just trying to keep up with everybody else, but like follow us as we follow Jesus. We trust that what he says is right. That's why Jesus doesn't just say, I'm the life or I'm the truth. He also says, I'm the way, the way, the truth, and the life. There's a certain way to live when we're following Jesus. 
And we're to align our lives to his ways so that we can experience his life. And what I love here is Paul is being very, very honest. Like he does in so many places, he is not perfect. If Paul was perfect, like if mature meant perfect, he does never do anything or think anything wrong. How could I live up to that model? I'd be like, I fall so short of that model. But Paul's like, no, no, my focus, my aim is on Jesus to be more like him. So I press on and I focus and I forget and I set my mind and I follow that example because we think it's best. Look at verse 18. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, listen to this line, even with tears. If there's anything you could, like if you could visualize what does Paul look like? He's in prison, writing this letter to his friends. If there's anything you can envision to help make sense of all these words he says, will you just envision the apostle Paul with tears rolling down his face? And he's like, I wanna tell you this with tears running down my face. He's not mad. He's not hating on anybody. With tears running down his face, whereas I have told you often before, I tell you now again with tears, many people live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Wow. It's a warning. People live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. That means they live for pleasure, more pleasure, more pleasure. Feed the appetites, feed the desires. And their glory is in their shame. Look at the specific warning he gives. Their mind is set on earthly things. Paul's warning is not just for quote unquote bad people. His warning is not just for people who do things that were like, I don't know that that's what, like, you shouldn't be doing that. His warning is also to people whose mind is set only on earthly things who live just for now, just for the temporary, and they miss the eternal. See, when Paul says they're enemies of the Christ, the cross of Christ, uh, there, there's one part that there's, there's the salvation element of the cross of Jesus. And Paul says, anybody who's working against the cross of Christ, anybody who's working against Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. They're enemies of the cross in that way, right? But also anybody who teaches ways that aren't what some theologians call a cruciform existence, meaning you're, you're living a cross-centered, Jesus-centered life. Anybody who says there's another way to live besides the way of Jesus, they're also an enemy of the cross. Anybody who's infatuated and obsessed only with the present reality of right now and they're missing the eternal. That's why he's got tears rolling down his face. He's like... They're an enemy of the cross because the eternal literally lasts forever. And the temporary is like a vapor and it's gone. And we live for so many things that are temporary, success or fame or pleasure or, or, or whatever it is, that's just poof, and it's gone. And we're being invited into an eternal kind of life that literally matters, that makes all the difference on us and on others. Listen, here's what I want you to be clear about. Paul doesn't say they think about earthly things. We all think about earthly things. We all think about a paycheck. Some of you think about a car payment. We all think about the weather. We think about earthly things. Paul doesn't say they think about earthly things. He says their mind is set on earthly things. It's almost inescapable. They refuse to think about eternal things. And he's inviting into a new way of thinking and a new way of living. Don't abandon the eternal, the pursuit of all that God has for us just for more stuff here and now that will be gone the moment we die. He's saying live for eternal. Look at verse 20. Paul says, but our citizenship is in heaven. He said that before. He's, a rem he's reminding us again. Yes, we live on earth. We're, we're squarely like I am in Southern California, whether you're in person or online, I'm here. But he says also spiritually, like in Christ, we've got one foot in heaven, one foot in eternity. Like, like Pastor Woody said a, a number of weeks ago, I've got a, an American, a U.S. citizen uh, passport, but I also, if it was tangible, I have a heavenly passport because of Jesus. Our citizenship is in heaven. 
And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Just a reminder, Jesus is coming back again. And I say that to encourage you and for good news, not to scare you. But if it scares you, then here's my invitation. Then please come to Jesus. We eagerly await a savior from there, from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. Who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control. What does he bring under his control? Everything. Because of his power, he's able to bring everything under his control. You know those things in our world that seem out of control? They won't always be out of control. You know those things in your life that you can't make any sense of here on this earth? The story isn't over. And by the power that Jesus has, where he is able to bring everything under his control. There, there's a whole theological discussion about control and what that means, but, but it just means we serve a God who is a good and faithful God, but we also live in a world that is bad and full of evil things. And God has given free will and agency to people. And sometimes people do horrendous and horrible things. And God hasn't intervened yet in some of those things, but he will intervene ultimately. And we can trust him and that his story isn't over. When we're in the midst of those moments, he's able to bring everything under his control. He will transform our lowly bodies. We we read in Philippians chapter two that Jesus humbled himself, left heaven, came to the earth. He died on a cross, a, a, a humiliating death, but God raised him victoriously to a new and glorious state. And here's what Paul's saying. We're going to get in on that. He will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Again, Paul is saying, even death on this earth isn't the end of your story or God's story. It ushers us into a new reality, which is truly the new beginning we all long for. I know this is a lot for a Sunday morning, three days after all the turkey you ate. (laughs) But what I want to say is this is way more than a slogan you put up on your wall or a a pick-me-up with your coffee. These are God's eternal truths that he is inviting us into to say, don't neglect them, don't forsake them, don't get distracted by other things, press on, forgetting those things that are behind, straining towards those things that are ahead. Would you allow your minds to be settled on the eternal, on who our God is, knowing him? And would you then follow the example Paul, Jesus, others have given for us to keep on pressing on even when it's hard, even when it doesn't make sense, even when you're all confused and say, God, I don't understand this circumstance or this life, but I'm going to trust you anyway. I'm not going to get distracted. I'm not going to be overcommitted to a thousand things and miss the one thing that matters more than anything. I'm not going to lay an example for my kids to follow anymore where I'm trying to be committed to a hundred things and fully neglect the one thing that matters the most. I'm not going to be paralyzed by shame or guilt or the failures of the past. By your grace, your forgiveness, your compassion, and your strength, I'm going to forget those things. Amen? Amen. Be set free and delivered to strain towards the new things, God, because what you're doing is a new thing. And if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things are gone. Behold, all things are new. So I'm not going to waste another Christmas season going through the motions consumed by the the newest gift or gadget or party, stressed out, anxious, and completely miss the peace and the joy and the hope and the love that Jesus ushers in. And we remember in this season, we're going to press on with our eyes towards you, God. Anybody with me on that? That's what we long for because we realize... We realize it's not about something being written on our mugs. It's about his word being written on our hearts and shaping us and forming us into his image. Because here's what we realized, like last week, knowing Christ is of surpassing worth. It's better. Here's what we realized. Jesus is better. Just fill in the blank. (laughs) Jesus is better. Jesus is more wonderful. Jesus is more amazing. Jesus is superior. Jesus is more beautiful. Jesus is worthy. 
Jesus is Lord? Do you believe? Jesus is a gracious Savior? Jesus is God? Come in human form? And so, Jesus, we want to worship you. One thing above everything is knowing you. I'm going to just ask, Pastor Woody and I talked about this. I'm going to ask for you to be bold if you need to be bold. If you're feeling today like God's stirring in your hearts, you need to press on. Invitation where God is just saying, you press on, press on, press on. Forget what is behind, strain towards what's, press on. Set your mind on things that are above, press on. Follow, follow the examples of Paul and Jesus that are going to bring life, not all those other examples, those other molds you're trying to be. Press on. Do you feel like anybody feel like Jesus is saying press on? If so, just stand up and I want to be able to pray over you. I know people are looking. Are you going to press on or not? If he's saying to you, like stirring your heart, press on, press on, press on. There's, there's some decisions that need to be made today. Press on. There's a change in some plans that you've had for the next month or two or life, press on. And so God, with every circumstance, we need your strength. I pray for these men and women. I pray for these young people like Paul, that they would press on towards the goal, the high calling of knowing you, Jesus, the the invitations for eternity. I know there's obstacles. I know there's stress and pain. I know there's anxiety. I I know there's fear. For some, there there may be addictions. For some, there may be relationships that are literally working against them pressing on. And they're like, how can I press on when I've got this going on? God, we want to confess, Jesus, you are greater than the obstacles we face. You are greater than any challenge in the way. And so God, for your supernatural strength, we pray, help us to press on. When things don't make sense and we're full of uncertainty, when things are difficult and we just want to give up, Lord, help us to press on. Fill us with your spirit. Empower us as only you can to press on, to follow you, Jesus. We thank you for how good you are. We thank you for how faithful we, but we just, we confess we need you. We can't do this on our own. And I pray that as these who are pressing on would would walk out of this place with a a fresh strength today, that others would, would be attracted to you, Jesus. Others would be encouraged. Others would be served and loved because as we press on, Lord, we begin to see uh, circumstances and see other people differently. So Lord, we want to press on for your glory and for the good of other people. Would you just use our lives, Lord? Here we are surrendering, saying we can't do it on our own, but saying, have your way. Help us to press on for your glory. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would everybody stand and let's just declare these truths to God.